Hello, my name is Rita Lanham, and I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, a member of Grace Anglican Community, a wife and mother of two wonderful daughters and a fantastic son-in-law. And I'm delighted that you are joining us for this series on deeper discipleship, especially um, conform to his image, the topic that we are covering today. Before we jump in, let's pray together the prayer of self-dedication from the Book of Common Prayer. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may, may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you, and then use us, we pray, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I was preparing for this session, an offering from the skit guys came to mind, the Beanie Weenie skit. Perhaps you're familiar with it, but if not, you can Google it or find a video on it on YouTube. It's hilarious and far better delivered than the little excerpt I will give you today. The skit is about two preppy teenage girls, Steffi and Candace, spending the afternoon binge watching the Days of Our Lives soap opera. During the course of the afternoon, Steffi turns to Candace and says, tell me about Jesus. And Candace says, okay. He wears these cool Hirachi sandals and he's got a nice long white robe and long brown hair with no split ends. And when he walks, his upper body doesn't move. Now, before you grab your phone and get to Amazon to buy some cool Hirachi sandals and a long white robe or decide to dye your hair brown or grow it out, I don't think this is the image that G of God or of Jesus that God had when he uh, referred to or tells us about it in Romans 8. For those he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. What God is referring to is the nature and character of his son Jesus, not what he physically looked like. God wants people to recognize his son in us, not through our physical appearance, but by our words, our actions, our behaviors, our values, and most of all, by our love. Being conformed to the image of Jesus begins when we give our life to Christ. We read in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Several times in his letter, Paul exhorts us to put off the old self and put on the new. In Ephesians 4, we read, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And in Colossians 3, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Throughout our lives, we have been influenced by people, circumstances, and experiences that have shaped us into who we are today. God loves us. He created us and gave us his personalities, but he loves us too much to let us stay where we are. He has given us his Holy Spirit, and he continually woos us to draw nearer to him, thus changing our hearts, our minds, and our spirits. Several years ago, a dear friend of mine and I went through a study, a workbook of sorts, on living into all that God has created us to be. One of the activities in that work workbook was to list our character strengths and weaknesses. Oh, it is so easy to list those strengths, but our weaknesses, that's a little bit harder. As I mulled over the list of character flaws that were in the workbook, such as impatient, unkind, rude, bitter, I kept stumbling over the word prideful. At the time, I opted not to check it, to not put it on my list of weaknesses. I reasoned that I was not as prideful as someone, well, whom I thought was more prideful than I was. However, as I shared in conversation with my friend, as those words came out of my mouth, I knew I had a problem with pride. My measuring stick was wrong. I'm not to compare, compare myself with others, as I'm not as bad as that person but rather the ideal God has set before us is his son, the glorified, radiant, resurrected Jesus. 
from that moment forward, God has done a work on me concerning pride, among other things, and believe me, he is not done with me yet. What God started in me that day was changing my mind. As we read in Romans 8, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And in Colossians 3, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seating, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are are on earth. And in Romans 12, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect a living sacrifice. That really got my attention. Richard Foster uh, writes, consider it, um, reflecting on this passage, that the problem with a living sacrifice is that it always wants to get up off the altar. This isn't easy, folks, but fortunately, we don't have to do it on our own. We have been given the Holy Spirit. We are not to compare ourselves to others or to settle for what the world offers, but we are to set our minds on Jesus and seek his ways, his desires, his kingdom. It was at that point that I became very intentional about being conformed into the image of Jesus. Now, while I don't know what your particular situation is or how God is working in your life right now, I do know that he is calling you. He's stirring in your heart. That is likely why you have joined this series on deep, Deeper Discipleship, and I encourage you to lean into that, to explore more what God has in store for you. In his book, Streams of Living Water, Richard Foster writes, the ultimate goal of the Christian life is an ever deeper formation of the inner personality as to reflect the glory and goodness of God, an ever more radiant conformity to the life and faith and desires and habits of Jesus, an utter transformation of our creatureliness into whole and perfect sons and daughters of God. You see, the goal of the Christian life is not simply to get us into heaven, but to get heaven into us. God is intent upon making you and me into a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine a bright, stainless mirror that reflects back to God perfectly his own boundless power and delight and goodness. So how are we to participate in this transformation process? First, we train. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy, rather train yourself for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So how do we train ourselves? Well, rather than tackle the issues of virtue and vice head on, we undertake activities of body, mind, and spirit that in time will build spiritual resources within us to act appropriately when the situation demands it. As athletes of God, we plan a regimen of spiritual disciplines that will um, stimulate our growth in grace. So you may be asking yourself, what are spiritual disciplines? Well, spiritual discipline is an intentionally directed action by which we do what we can do in order to receive from God the ability or power to do what we cannot do by direct effort. We engage in spiritual disciplines to train our hearts, bodies, and minds so that when we encounter a situation that it is not possible for us on our own to be Christ-like, we are able to act in a Christ-like manner sometimes much to our own amazement. Through spiritual disciplines, we give God access to mold and shape us, to train and prepare us that we may reflect his glory into the world. There are lots of different resources on spiritual disciplines. Um, we will be looking more deeply into spiritual disciplines in the spring offering of adult forum. For now, however, I'd like to provide a brief introduction. I personally have found the Life with God Bible uh, very helpful in the area of um, 
spiritual disciplines. The theme in the commentary throughout this Bible is, as the name implies, life with God, and it focuses on spiritual disciplines. There are examples throughout this Bible of how to put spiritual disciplines into practice. There is also a companion devotional, A Year with God, living out, living out the spiritual disciplines, which is excellent. It provides spiritual practices that you can undertake and then follows with devotions related to that practice for the next 10 days. There is nothing specific or special about the 10-day period. It's just what they chose um, to focus on. We will be looking at some examples from that book in just a minute. For now, I just want you to view a list of the spiritual disciplines that are found in the Life with God Bible. There's a big list there. Um, I invite you to read over them, and perhaps the Holy Spirit will tug your heart in one or more of those areas, and you can seek more information on those. Um, I am going to share um, some of the disciplines. Uh, I'll give you the definition of the discipline and then an example of the spiritual practice. The first one we're going to look at is prayer. Prayer is always an excellent place to start. Um, the definition is interactive conversation with God about what we and God are thinking and doing together. And one of the spiritual practice examples is, for the next 10 days, try to engage in simple prayer, sharing with God all the events in your life and your feelings about them, your hopes, desires, frustrations, and anger. Do this at least once a day. Do not try to present yourself as better or more holy than you feel you are. Do not worry that you are being too self-centered or that you are sharing with God what you know to be sin. Just share. God knows what is going on with you anyway, and it just is a, an opening for you to share your entire life with him. In prayer, we learn God's faithfulness. We learn his love. We experience his peace and his joy. The next discipline we're going to look at is study. The intentional process of engaging the mind with the written and spoken word of God and the world God has created in such a way that the mind takes on an order conforming to the order upon which it concentrates. The example of a spiritual practice regarding study is for the next 10 days, choose one long passage, perhaps a longer psalm such as Psalm 119, several chapters of one of the gospels or an entire letter, letter of the New Testament. Read your selected passage each day, beginning by asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate it for you, to show you its meaning. You might want to do something different each time. For the first few days, focus on repetition in reading the passage. Try reading it aloud or writing it out longhand. Then move to concentration. Seek to memorize parts of the passage by putting a couple of verses on a sticky note and sticking it to your bathroom mirror or your desk or computer monitor, or to the window above your sink. Next, consider the interpretation. You might want to read what a commentary has to say about the passage or study the footnotes in your Bible. Finally, end with reflection. Think about the passage and what you have learned. Throughout, try to enter into the reading each day with an open mind, ready to let God show you whatever is helpful. Our minds will be conformed by whatever it is we concentrate on. So studying the word of God enables our minds to be conformed to his word so that what comes to mind as we um, experience the various things that come into our life will be his word rather than the things of the world, what we see on TV or on Facebook or by entertainment. It allows us to discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The next spiritual discipline we'll look at is confession. That's one that's sometimes kind of hard, isn't it? Sharing our deepest weaknesses and failures with God and trusted others so that we may enter into God's grace and mercy and experience his ready forgiveness and healing. The spiritual practice, take time in prayer to make confession. This practice may be something you already do regularly. If so, think of it as paying special attention to this part of your prayer life. Perhaps you will want to focus on a particular sin each day, or perhaps you would rather simply ask forgiveness for the sins that you have committed that day. In prayer, go through the three steps of, ex of examination of conscience, sorrow, and determination to avoid sin in the future. This was the first place that I turned when God revealed to me that I had a problem with pride. 
I, I went straight to prayer and to confession. And what I found was God's mercy, his loving kindness, his patience, and his gentleness. Guidance is the next one we will look at. Experiencing an interactive friendship with God that gives direction and purpose to daily life. The spiritual practice is, throughout the next 10 days, study various ways God has guided his people throughout the Bible, and also consider ways you have been and continue to be guided by God. Be open to hearing God's counsel in many different ways, in scripture, in a still small voice, or in the words of another person. As you read, try to imagine what it must have been like for these people to hear God's voice. Look at how God approached them and how they reacted. It is in guidance that we learn to seek the things that are above. We see God's goodness and his faithfulness. And finally, the last one we will look at today is sacrifice. Deliberately forsaking the security of satisfying our own needs with our resources in the faith and hope that God will sustain us. An example of the spiritual practice for sacrifice is for the next 10 days, for each of the next 10 days, find one small way you can make a sacrifice as an offering to God. For example, give all the money in your wallet to a homeless person. You, your sacrifice could also include a form of service which often involves the sacrifice of your time. Another idea is to sacrifice some sleep so that you can spend extra time in the morning or at night in prayer. Think of each offering as a way of being obedient to God. That way, your sacrifice will not be empty, but will show God honor and respect. It is through these small sacrifices that we learn to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. We learn obedience, and we live in faith and hope in God that he will sustain us. So those are some examples of the spiritual disciplines, ways that you can engage with God and start changing your mind and your spirit and um, to be conformed into the likeness of his son. And don't worry if you don't get it right. The purpose of the spiritual disciplines is not to master the discipline itself, nor to get us into heaven, but to get heaven into us. The disciplines provide a way in which God is able to build within us deeply ingrained habits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So in order to participate with God in conforming us to the image of his son, we train ourselves by engaging in spiritual disciplines. Secondly, we invite others to travel the journey with us. Such persons become both companions and mentors. They provide us with discernment counsel and encouragement. Such spiritual companionship also provides a loving accountability. In Proverbs 27 we read, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. That's the beauty of accountable relationships. We can help each other and keep each other sharp. In his book, The Heart of the Artist, Rory Noland writes, we think we can handle life on our own, but that is such a lie. When we underestimate our need for accountable relationships, we give Satan an open invitation to knock us off. God puts other Christians in our lives to help mold and shape us, to help keep us on his path and not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Here at Grace, we are calling these covenant groups. Small groups of people, perhaps three to five, make a commitment to one another to walk together in an effort to, to promote spiritual growth and formation. If you would like more information about these, you can reach out to Father Bob or Bill Russell or post in our discussion group for deeper discipleship. Don't be deceived. Being a Christian is not easy. Having a trusted group of fellow disciples to walk with you on, a journey, on the journey is an incredible blessing. So we train. We engage with others on the journey. And, and then third, when we stumble and fall, we get up and start again. Stumbling is part of the process. On our journey to become like Christ, we will stumble. If we have sinned, we need to confess and repent, but we don't give up and we don't dwell on our mistakes. We know that God loves us and he will not forsake us. We are not in this for a quick fix and then if it doesn't work, we quit. 
We are in this for the long haul, knowing that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So as we work through this process of being conformed to the likeness of Christ, as we put off the old self and put on the new, as we set our minds on things above, let us look once again to the guidance that Paul gives us, this time in his letter to the Colossians. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We close with a prayer from the book, Having a Merry Spirit by Joanna Weaver. Lord Jesus Christ, I give you my life. I invite you to have your way in me. Take me and break me. Shake me and make me. Fill me and spill me. Change me and rearrange me. But whatever you do, Lord, don't leave me the same. Spirit of wisdom and revelation, I welcome your work. Open my eyes so I can see, my ears so I can hear. I choose truth over comfort, challenge over complacency. Lord, make me forever yours, and most of all, make me like you. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We will see you next Sunday where we will look at living as a father, living as a son to the father. In the meantime, we would love for you to join us for a discussion. The link for our Facebook discussion group is in the description of this video. The group is a great place to share discussion and ask questions for each session. Also, if you have enjoyed this session or this series, please give us a thumbs up on this video. Subscribe to us here on YouTube and like us on Facebook. We really appreciate it. God bless you all.